Dead America, El Paso, Creeping Death, Part 2. Dead America, The Second Month. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by Aaron Smith. Chapter 1 The sun rose over the sleepy community of Fabens to the east of El Paso. The night guards were still on watch near the interstate, keeping an eye out for Rodriguez and the rest of the cartel reinforcements. To the south of the command center, at the bridges over the large draining ditch, some of the lesser able citizens kept busy installing obstacles along the edge. Broom handles filed down into spikes were driven into the south bank of the ditch. Couches, chairs, and other household furniture were put up like a giant outdoor living room display. Even as they moved the items there, they knew it wouldn't do much to stem the tide of ghouls headed their way. But even buying precious minutes could mean the difference between life and death. Across town, Leon stepped out of his house, stretching on the front porch, and looking around, surveying the work that had gone on throughout the night. As he did, Rogers walked across the yard from his house. You ready for the big day? the detective asked, hooking a thumb into his belt. Leon nodded. Let's hope it's big, he replied. If we're going to survive this, Rodriguez needs to come through in a big way. Rogers motioned to the civilians that had worked through the night on the barricades. Even if he doesn't, at least we have everyone in town on the same page, he pointed out. Leon shook his head. With what's coming our way, this feels more like busy work to keep them distracted than an actual defense plan, he admitted. Guess I have to find a new nickname for you, the detective drawled. Because Captain Optimism just isn't going to cut it. Leon shrugged. Gave up optimism years ago, he said. Bad for the health. I found my body reacts better to cynicism and whiskey. Rogers chuckled. I knew we were kindred spirits from the moment we met, he declared. The two men shared a laugh and immediately after an air horn went off in the distance. It was the interstate watch, signaling the arrival of vehicles. Rodriguez isn't messing around, Leon murmured. Rogers nodded. Guess that's my cue to go into hiding, he said with a deep sigh. I'll be at the school. A couple of the people in town used to do construction, so they set me up with a hideaway spot, built into the corner of the gym. Even has a hidden door to get in, so if the cartel comes in there, they won't give it a second look. Well, you enjoy your much-deserved vacation while I do the heavy lifting, Leon drawled playfully. The detective laughed and clapped him on the shoulder. You know I will, he promised. Thankfully, one of the townsfolk is an avid reader, so I have a stack of things to work through. I expect book reports when you get out, Leon said, pointing a finger at him. Rogers grinned and grabbed his hand, pulling him in for a bro hug. You'll be safe, he said sincerely. I'll see you on the other side. Leon nodded as he watched his friend head off towards the school. As he turned back around, the air horn went off again, prompting him to pick up the pace towards the command center. Soon, Sparks, Rufus, Jeff, Clara, and Trenton emerged from their respective houses to join him. Everyone carried weapons and an equipment bag. Most of them were wide-eyed, but seemed ready to go, save for Rufus, who looked disheveled, still buttoning up his flannel shirt. That's a hell of an alarm clock you got there, he said hoarsely. Leon shot him a lopsided smile. Sorry to interrupt your beauty sleep there, buddy. Rufus chuckled. Well, I'm not the one who has to look at my ugly mug all day, so if you can't handle it, make sure to install a snooze button on that alarm. I'll see what I can do, Leon quipped. The group came up the road, making the turn down a side street, so that the command center was within view. As they walked, they spotted two trucks and two SUVs parked out front, with Rodriguez and a handful of cartel members standing about. Leon's brow furrowed. Man, this better be the first wave of reinforcements he said loudly, because if not, we're fucked. The rest of the group remained silent, the stark reality setting in. A couple dozen people fighting against a horde of a million zombies was destined to fail. As they grew closer, their worst fears were realized. There were only four vehicles from the cartel. Leon stalked up to Rodriguez. Where's everybody else? he demanded. Tiago has them fortifying El Paso, the tall man replied. Leon let out a deep whoosh of breath, looking around at the half-dozen men outside of the vehicles. So there's what, a dozen of you? he asked, throwing up his hands. How the hell are we supposed to fight off the horde and fortify this town with this little support? 
Rodriguez shook his head, jaw clenched. Tiago is only interested in buying time, not saving your town, he replied, remaining stoic, but from what Leon could see, his eyes were apologetic. Every man here has been given orders to focus on the horde, and nothing more. Leon growled, grinding his teeth together. Still, Rodriguez cut in, raising a hand, he left me in charge of this outing. So, if you desperately need some extra hands, I can spare a few men for a short time. Leon's shoulders relaxed a touch and nodded at the man. He knew that Rodriguez was in the toughest position of all, having to play both sides. Angel Riva stepped out of the last vehicle in line and waltzed up to the group. You should be thankful you're getting even this much support, he drawled, spreading his arms and then straightening his expensive jacket. Leon glared at him, side-glancing Clara next to him, who was seething at the man who had scarred her. If you were smart, you'd be dropping to your knees and thanking the Lord above for my presence, Angel continued, raising his smug chin. I can blow things up better than anybody in the cartel, so just by me being here, you might have an extra few hours of existence before you are overrun. His eyes locked onto Clara, and he licked his lips, leering at her. Oh, will wonders never cease, he said. My special little princess. If you want to drop to your knees, I have another job for you other than praying. She clenched her fist and lunged for him. You motherfucker! Rodriguez caught her around the waist and swung her back, away from being killed by the cartel members. Angel simply laughed, wagging a finger at her. So feisty, he said. I like it when they're feisty. Clara shrieked. I will rip your dick off you! Enough! Rodriguez barked, shoving her back behind Leon. She continued to seethe, but stood with her friends despite the fire in her eyes. Oh, and she takes direction, Angel continued, winking at her. I can have fun with that. Rodriguez glared at him. Get to work on those bombs now, he snapped. You watch your tone, Angel declared, puffing out his chest. Rodriguez stepped towards him, staring coldly at the younger Rivas. You're going to do as you're told, or you're going to pay the price, he snarled. You may be a daddy's boy, but out here, you're under my command. Now get to work! Angel hissed at him, but turned on his heel and stormed away in a huff towards the back of the rearmost truck. Rodriguez turned back to the group and stepped up to Clara, leaning in and speaking in a low voice, so that his men couldn't hear. I understand that man hurt you, yes? He asked softly. She wasn't paying attention, simply staring daggers at Angel's retreating back. Rodriguez snapped his fingers in front of her face, and she startled, blinking up at him. That man hurt you, yes? He repeated quietly. Clara focused on him and nodded, letting out a deep breath. Yes, he did. She pulled her T-shirt out far enough so that he could see the large scar carved into her breast. He did that after kidnapping my friend, who I never saw again. He nodded. You know what is headed our way, don't you? He asked. She clenched her jaw. Yes, I do. That man, that man has skills that we can use, he said, inclining his head towards Angel. Skills that may very well be the difference between this town surviving or not. So, you understand that we need him, don't you? Clara looked at Sparks next to her and the officer gave her arm a reassuring squeeze. Yes, the younger woman finally said. I understand. Rodriguez leaned closer. But remember, he whispered, we won't always need him. He gave her a wink before backing up and straightening up. Clara stifled a smile. So, what's the plan? Rodriguez asked loudly, crossing his arms. Leon finally relaxed his arms, shifting his weight. Our current projections have the front edge of the horde reaching the outskirts of Fort Stockton this evening after the sun goes down, he explained. This is going to be problematic as we're going to have to divert them at night. We don't really have much of a choice, though. Do you have plans to slow them down? Rodriguez asked. Leon nodded. We have four vehicles rigged to explode on a timer, he replied. If we can get them to the horde, they can plow through them before detonating. We also have flamethrowers ready to go, which should slow them down as well. These aren't long-term solutions, but if we play our cards right, it could buy us hours. We will take what we can get, Rodriguez replied. How do you propose we move forward? 
Leon turned his head. Trenton, you have the most dangerous job today, he said. What do you need? The younger man took a deep breath. I need a driver at a minimum, he replied. Could use someone who knows their way around a drone, too. I need to find a good spot just off of the highway to lay low once I pull some off of the main group. Rodriguez whistled and pointed to two men, waving them over. Navier, Carlos, help this young man with whatever he needs, he instructed. Take one of the SUVs. There is a drone in the back of both. The men nodded, and Javier gave Trenton a wave. We're ready whenever you are, man, he said. Trenton glanced at Leon. Unless you need me for something, we should get going. Hold on a sec, the older man said, turning to look at Rufus. How long does it take you to rig a car? Rufus shrugged. Then, maybe fifteen minutes, he replied. Take the back roads to the east side of Fort Stockton, Leon said to Trenton. Take a car and leave it a mile short of the interstate exit. That way we'll have another arrow in our quiver. Rodriguez snapped his fingers. Navia, go with the kid and get a car of your own, he instructed. If we're going up that far, we might as well make it worth our while. Javier nodded and joined Trenton. They shook hands and then introduced themselves as Trenton led him to the lot behind the command center, where their car stash was. Meet us by the bridge and we'll head out, the younger man called over his shoulder at Carlos, who nodded and then hopped back into his SUV, speeding off. What else needs to be done for Fort Stockton? Rodriguez asked. Leon raised his chin. We're planning on doing another diversion group to the north of town on the highway, he explained, so we need a team to head up there and make sure the coast is clear. The satellite showed little, but if they're spread out it could be a nasty surprise. Why don't we send the young lady there to handle that? Rodriguez asked. Clara bristled. Don't patronize me, she snapped. I'm capable. I understand that, Rodriguez replied, keeping his tone level but I also think it could do you some good to get away from certain people for a while, and he's going to be on the interstate detail. She pursed her lips, but nodded. Come on, I'll go with you, Jeff drawled, poking her in the shoulder. I found a car with a working CD player in it, so we can rock out while we scout. He raised his forefinger and pinky finger in the classic devil horn sign. Clara raised an eyebrow. Define rocking out, she asked. Judas Priest, screaming for vengeance, cranked to eleven? He shrugged. She nodded. Okay, I'm in, she said immediately. Lead the way. They grabbed their gear and headed towards the parking lot. Make sure you have your radios, Leon called, and Jeff gave him a thumbs up over his shoulder as they left. I guess that leaves the rest of us tasked with slowing down the horde, Rodriguez said. Sound about right? Leon nodded. Yep, he replied. I'll stay here and keep an eye on the satellite. I have a runner ready to go who will ride up and provide info if something out of the ordinary happens. Regardless of how much we are able to slow them down, Rodriguez said, taking a deep breath, we are going to rendezvous on the east side of town an hour before sundown. If you can send your runner up then, with the current information, that will be helpful. Leon nodded again. Consider it done. Everybody mount up, Rodriguez yelled, rolling his hand above his head. We're on the move. Leon turned to Sparks and Rufus, keeping his voice low. You be careful out there, he murmured. And if you see an opportunity to get close to Rodriguez, away from everyone else, do it. He may have information to pass along. You got it, Sparks replied with a sharp nod. Come on, girl, Rufus said, offering her his elbow. We got a long day ahead of us. She smirked and slipped her arm into his, and they headed off towards the parking lot behind the command center. Leon stood along in front, watching everyone drive away. After a few moments of relative peace, he turned around at the sound of the front door of the command center opening. Ethel popped her head out. How are we looking? she asked. Looking like a long day, he admitted. Well, come in and get comfy, she replied with a warm smile. I got some breakfast for you. Leon shook his head, grinning back at her. Not sure what I'd do without you, Ethel, he said, spreading his arms. My guess is you'd starve, she quipped. He chuckled as he headed inside. Hard to argue with that. Chapter 2 Eight vehicles lined the side of the road on the highway just before the I-10 interstate. Rufus and Sparks were the last to arrive, pulling up and seeing numerous cartel members hanging about. 
Rodriguez stood alone to greet them as they got out of the vehicle. We were beginning to worry about you, he said, raising an eyebrow. Yeah, sorry, Rufus replied. Front end was a little wonky, so we didn't want to push it too hard. The taller man nodded. Understandable, he said. Does it need to be fixed? Nah, as long as we can hitch a ride with you back to town, I'll just rig it to blow, Rufus replied, waving him off. We have plenty of room, Rodriguez assured them. Sparks cocked her head. So, what's the plan? Angel is busy checking the explosives on the cars, Rodriguez replied, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. I've already done that, Rufus replied, crossing his arms. Rodriguez shrugged. He was very insistent that he get to do it, he replied with a sigh. Which, to be frank, is fine by me as it shuts him up. I'm sure you do fine work. Rufus smirked. With management skills like that, it's easy to see why you're the number two, he drawled. Yes, with him half of my decisions are based on how big of a headache I want to deal with that day, Rodriguez admitted. How long until he has it ready to go? Sparks asked. Rodriguez shrugged. He said the half an hour, he replied, tilting his head back and forth. Which really means an hour. Well, while they do that, why don't we go try out the flamethrowers? She asked. Get a feel for how effective they're going to be. Rodriguez nodded. I'll have one of my men drivers, he offered. As he walked away, Rufus took Sparks' arm, leaning close to her ear. You sure about this girl? he whispered. She nodded, turning back to him. After what he said to Clara? Yeah, I'm sure, she replied quietly. Plus, remember what Leon said? Rufus frowned at her, and then let out a deep breath, nodding. I'll be safe, I promise, she said, leaning forward and planting a soft kiss on his mouth. He winked at her. Hold on a sec, he said, and turned, reaching into the car and pulling out a redneck rattler. Just in case you get into a tight spot. He handed it over, and she took it with a smirk. Forget jewelry, she said. Just keep me in high explosives, and I'm a happy girl. He grinned. Just doing my job, he said. She saluted him with the rattler and sauntered off to the truck, making sure to give him a show of her sashaying behind as she left. Rodriguez stood in the bed and held out a hand to help her up into the high back. Once she settled in, she smacked the side of the vehicle, and the driver punched the gas. They picked up speed quickly as they hit the interstate, keeping quiet because the wind whipping around them would have made it impossible to talk. Sparks leaned back, eyeing him as he stared out into the distance, stone-faced. She got comfortable for the several-mile ride, only briefly reacting when they passed the exit where she'd been living for the better part of the last month. While a part of her couldn't help but be saddened that her little hideaway was soon to be gone, she was happy about the prospect of living in a community again, partially because there were more people, but mostly it would be nice for her and Rufus to have their own space again. The ride was relatively short, ending after what seemed like a matter of minutes. The truck came to a screeching halt in the middle of the road, prompting the passengers to exchange a confused glance. That didn't take long. Sparks said. The driver shoved the back window open. Boss, he said, panic in his tone. The duo stood up and looked over the roof of the truck. Less than a mile away was the horde, still shoulder to shoulder across the interstate, stretching as far as the eye could see. Sparks turned to her tentative partner, studying his stoic face as he gazed upon the mass of marching rotted flesh. She could see a flicker of fear beneath, and she raised an eyebrow. First time confronting the enemy? she asked. He took a deep breath. I saw my share of action in the first week of the outbreak, he replied. The fast movers were difficult to deal with, however. I think this will be our greatest challenge by far. I tend to agree with you there, she admitted. So, what do you say we get started? Rodriguez nodded and smacked the roof to get the driver's attention. Get us turned around and back us up to them he instructed. Go slow, and I'll let you know when to stop. The truck executed a slow three-point turn and started to back up. As they inched closer to the horde, Sparks and Rodriguez readied their flamethrowers. He turned the water gun over in his hand, raising an eyebrow. 
I've used a lot of things to hurt people over the years, he drawled. But a child's water gun is a first. How does this work exactly? Sparks held out her hand, and he set the water gun in her palm. She reached into a bag and pulled out a stick with a ball of steel wool on the end of it. She attached it to the top of the gun and lit it, resulting in a simmering red glow, and then handed it back. It's loaded with kerosene, she explained, so just make sure you pump it several times to build up pressure, aim it in an arc, and let her rip. Should go fifteen, twenty yards out? Rodriguez appraised the weapon with awe in his gaze. Pretty ingenious, he said. Wish I could take credit for it, she replied with a chuckle. He smacked the side of the truck a few times, prompting the driver to stop about fifty yards from the horde. When I give you the signal, I want you to start inching forward, Rodriguez called over his shoulder. Do your best to keep us at a steady pace matching theirs. Do you understand? Gotcha, boss, the driver replied. Sparks got her weapon ready, lighting her steel wool and standing up. The scent began to waft from the horde, a pungent wall of sick rot, and she wrinkled her nose. How much fuel do we have? Rodriguez asked. She inclined her head towards the bag. We have six of these canisters, so don't be afraid to let loose, she replied. Good to know, he said with a nod. The two of them stood there, waiting patiently for the horde to close the gap. When they got within ten yards, Rodriguez let out a whistle, prompting the driver to start inching along. He took aim, but stopped before pulling the trigger. My apologies, he said. Where are my manners? He gestured with a flourish towards the zombies. Ladies first. Sparks inclined her head, bending her knees in a faux curtsy. Thank you, she said. I do appreciate a gentleman. She pumped her weapon a few times before taking aim. As she pulled the trigger, a powerful stream of flaming liquid squirted out, flying about twenty yards away from the truck. The bulk of the liquid landed on zombies in a straight line, sticking to their clothes and catching fire. Some of the kerosene that didn't reach the horde splashed on the ground and continued to burn, staying lit long enough for the zombies to catch up. While some footsteps put out the flames, others soon had flaming pants. It took several moments for the fire to spread, but soon a few dozen creatures were ablaze. One by one they dropped to the ground, creating a small empty patch in the middle of the giant mass that tripped up some ghouls. This is more effective than I thought it was going to be, Rodriguez admitted. Sparks nodded. Same here, she agreed. Why don't you give it a go? He stepped up and primed his water gun before unleashing a fiery blast. Instead of shooting in a straight line, he moved his stream from side to side, creating a bit of a wave effect on the horde. Some flames crept up, eventually engulfing several dozen, which created more stumbling as they fell down. Oh, I like your strategy better, Spark said. I'll do that next time. The truck crept along as the two of them took turns splashing the ghouls with flaming liquid. While they weren't taking out a ton of them, they were slowing the march, even if it was minimal. Every second counted. Can I ask you a personal question? She asked. He raised an eyebrow. Only if you permit me to do the same, he replied. Fair enough, she agreed. Then, by all means, he replied, waving for her to continue. What would you like to know? Sparks took a deep breath. I heard what you said to Clara, and Leon has told me what you have done for the community, she began. Knowing that, it seems quite strange that you are second in command of the cartel. I guess my question is, what gives? Rodriguez paused and then turned to look over his shoulder. Turn on music and roll up your windows, he said to the driver. I'll bang on the side if you need to speed up. The driver didn't comment, simply complied. Once music thumped from the cab, Rodriguez's shoulders relaxed. Apologies, some things are not for his ears, he said. Your limited interactions with me may have given you a skewed view of who I am. I have risen up the ranks to be the right-hand man of one of the most vicious cartel bosses in the land. Let me assure you that one does not get into this position without getting their hands dirty. Extremely dirty. She shrugged. It's just confusing, that's all, she admitted. You clearly have your heart in the right place. So how does a man with at least some moral center end up where you are? 
Rodriguez paused and motioned for Sparks to hand him another canister of fuel so they could both reload. I'm in the position I'm in because of my family, he said as he clicked the fuel into place. We lived in a very poor and violent town with few opportunities outside of joining the cartel, or being a dirt-poor farmer. My father, God rest his soul, decided on the latter option. He managed to provide for me, my brother and mother, until he was gunned down by a gang, wanting to send a message after I chased them away from trying to extort him for his crops. Upon hearing this, Tiago Rivas came to speak to me directly. Knowing that I had some prior run-ins with this particular gang, most of which ended with them in the hospital, he said if I agreed that he would take care of my family. Sparks nodded thoughtfully. So, you sold your soul for the sake of your family? She replied as she sprayed another long stream of napalm onto the horde. I can respect that. Was he true to his word? Oh, very much so, Rodriguez replied, nodding. You don't last long as a leader if you don't honor your promises. He moved my mother out of that town and into a safe neighborhood in Mexico City. And your brother? she asked. He sighed. From the time my brother was old enough to walk, he had dreams of being a luchador, he said. We used to spend every weekend watching El Santo on TV, beating down everyone in his path, and my brother just couldn't get enough of it. Tiago made sure his dream came true, sending him to the best wrestling school in Mexico. For the past five years, he's been wrestling professionally as the Blue Diablo. The Blue Diablo, huh? Sparks asked, cocking a brow. Small world. He was on a couple of the cards I did early in my career but I never got to work with him. Didn't get to see him in the ring all that much, but I remember him as being a high flyer. Rodriguez stopped firing his weapon, turning to blink at her in shock. Forgive me, he said slowly, shaking his head, but I was under the impression that you were a police officer. Can a girl multitask? she asked with a smirk. He laughed and then resumed firing. You are quite right, my apologies, he said. No need to apologize. Sparks assured him. It was a fun way for me to blow off steam after having to spend fifty hours a week in a macho, male-dominated industry. I can't tell you how therapeutic it was after a full week of being passed over for promotions, because I was a woman, to step into the ring and be treated as an equal as I beat the hell out of the man. Rodriguez gaped at her again. You wrestled men? Oh, absolutely, she replied with a sly grin. I wasn't quite the high flyer like your brother was, but I could hold my own. I was even the championship belt holder of my promotion, before the world went to hell. He nodded thoughtfully. You intrigue me, Sparks, he said. I like that. She stepped up beside him and opened fire on the horde once again, splashing another few dozen ghouls with flaming liquid. All told, there were several hundred zombies either on fire or in various stages of smoldering on the ground creating a decent gap between them and the zombies on the other side of the interstate. "'You think we should start working on that side?' she asked, inclining her head towards it. Rodriguez shook his head. "'No, we'll let the cars deal with that side,' he said. "'It'll give us a good idea of what works best.' "'Good point,' Sparks agreed, nodding. They sprayed in silence for a few moments before she took a deep breath. "'Can I ask you another question?' she asked. Rodriguez nodded. I'm an open book, he replied. If Tiago Rivas has done all these things for your family, Sparks said slowly, why are you betraying him now? He chewed his lower lip for a moment and then sighed. Before all this began, the only people I was asked to hurt were people who were in the drug game, he began. People who chose this life, people who knew the risks. Sure, there was the occasional innocent that was caught in the crossfire, and I will go to my grave regretting each and every one of those lives. He shook his head. But something changed when we came across the border. All of a sudden, everyone was in the crosshairs. Not just the sick who needed to be eliminated. Men, women, children, all were fair game. If they could be used, they were enslaved. If they couldn't be useful, they were destroyed. His gaze darkened. That I am not okay with. So I made the decision to fight back starting with a mutual friend of ours. He touched his ear to reference Detective Rogers, whose ear he'd shot off in order to spare his life. Speaking of mutual friends, 
I have information on another one. He glanced over his shoulder to make sure the driver was still not listening to him. He is being held in a nondescript three-story government building, two blocks to the east of City Hall. I am working on securing a safe house for our friends to operate out of, as well as a way in, but I have neither at the moment. Sparks nodded. Thank you, she said sincerely. I will pass that information along. They shared an uneasy smile, knowing they were in dangerous territory, in more ways than one. They pumped their water guns a few more times, unleashing another torrent of flaming liquid onto the masses, pausing to watch them burn in silence. That silence was broken by two horns bleating loudly in the distance. They turned to see two sedans sitting in the road about half a mile back. Rodriguez smacked the roof of the truck, getting the driver to turn off the music and open the back window. "'Go up to them,' he instructed. The driver complied and picked up speed quickly as Sparks and Rodriguez sat down. When they reached the vehicles, the latter hopped out while Sparks kept an eye on the horde. "'Are these two ready to go?' Rodriguez asked, and the closest driver nodded. "'Yes, boss,' he replied. "'Good,' Rodriguez continued. "'Set one up on the other side of the interstate and send it on its way.' The driver nodded and bumbled across the grassy median, stopping in the center of the road. He quickly hopped out and attached a rope to the bottom of the steering wheel and seat, making sure it was secure so the car would stay relatively straight. He took out his lighter and lit the fuse on the redneck rattler that Rufus had installed, which was positioned just above the gas tank for maximum effect. As soon as the fuse began to work its way through the back seat towards the bottom floorboard, the driver tossed a brick onto the gas pedal and then leapt back out of the way to avoid being run over. The car picked up speed quickly, taking mere moments before smacking into the front edge of the horde. Bodies flew through the air from the initial impact, the tires catching on a few ghouls on the ground, causing the vehicle to get some air and crash down on even more zombies. The car veered sideways, rolling over several times and crushing more creatures. After a few violent smacks it came to a rest on its roof, leaving a trail of mangled corpses in its wake. The crew waited anxiously as the fuse continued to burn, the mass of zombies swarming around the vehicle and continuing their walk as if the car wasn't even there. Within moments of the car being swallowed up, the redneck rattler detonated. The sound was deafening, even from nearly half a mile away, sending a giant fireball into the sky. Shrapnel shredded zombies in every direction, cutting them in half and dropping them to the ground. Several right beside the car were completely eviscerated, leaving nothing but a lake of goo. When the smoke and debris finally settled, the group looked on, seeing a massive hole in the corpse mass, about thirty yards in circumference. A few of the low-level drivers let out a cheer and high fives, which Rodriguez raised a hand to shush down. "'Yes, that went better than expected,' he said loudly. "'But look!' The two drivers stopped celebrating seeing that within seconds the massive hole had been filled, the zombies marching over their liquefied brethren like nothing had happened. "'Instead of cheering, I suggest you get back to work,' Rodriguez continued, "'because we're going to need a lot more vehicles if we're going to stop them.' The men quickly turned back to prepping the next car for its suicide run. Rodriguez walked back up to the truck, leaning on the side of the bed and looking up at Sparks. "'At least the explosion was nice.' she said dryly. He nodded thoughtfully. We're going to need a lot more of them, I'm afraid, he said. Bigger ones, too. If anybody can do it, it's Rufus, she replied with a wistful smile. Rodriguez took a deep breath. What would you like to do now? She glanced into their bag, checking on their reserve water gun tanks. We still have four total fuel canisters left, she said. I say we let that car detonate, then get back to burning them down. "'Sounds good to me,' Rodriguez replied, and braced his foot against the large truck tire, hopping up into the bed next to her. The two of them turned to watch the next vehicle scream down the interstate towards the mass of rotting flesh. Neither of them flinched as the car exploded. Just another day at the office. Chapter 3 Jeff and Clara took the long way around Fort Stockton, emerging on the north side of town and finally finding the highway that led out. 
They stopped a mile up from the interstate and a mile east of the target highway. Clara studied a map, trying to figure out their specific location. So, any clue where we are? Jeff asked. She traced her finger along the road. Looks like if we go up another half mile and make a left, that it should take us to a highway. Sounds good, he replied, and hit the gas. They drove up to an empty rural road with nothing but open space on either side, barren, inhospitable land. A few moments later, he found the side street and made the turn. Should be about a mile, and we'll hit it, Clara murmured. Jeff looked around at the nothingness. I can't believe we're only a few miles outside the city, and there's nothing out here, he mused. Just the way it is out in West Texas, she replied. It's like someone airdropped some civilization into the middle of nowhere, and kept going. He nodded. Pre-apocalypse, I would have hated this, he admitted. But now I'm pretty okay with there being nothing around. As he spoke, they spotted a few zombies on the side of the road, tangled up in some barbed wire. They thrashed violently when they heard the car, trying in vain to get out of their trap. Those things are even out here, Clara said, shaking her head. There's about to be a whole lot more of them once the day is out, Jeff replied. She sighed heavily. I still can't wrap my head around just how many of those things are headed our way, she said. Hell, I saw them and still can't get a grip on it, Jeff agreed. They stopped at the next intersection looking around. He pointed to a highway sign. Looks like this is it, he said. Clara studied the map for a moment, tracing her finger to the north. Looks like there is an intersection about four or five miles up, she said. I say we hit that and call it good. Jeff hesitated, chewing his lip for a moment. She furrowed her brow. Are you okay? she asked gently. Huh? He blinked at her and then nodded. Yeah, just... I wanted to ask about what all that business was with that cartel creep. But as you can probably tell by looking at me, words aren't exactly my strong suit. She chuckled and patted the giant skinhead on the shoulder. It's okay, she said. I mean, I'm okay, if that's what you're worried about. He nodded and hit the gas, sending them towards their destination. That's good to know, he replied as they drove. I just didn't know if I needed to add bashing that motherfucker's head into my list of things to do this week. Absolutely not, she said firmly. He swallowed hard, a little embarrassed that he'd crossed a line, and opened his mouth to apologize. Although, she continued, cutting him off before he could start, if you want to hold him down while I bash his head in, I'm okay with that. He laughed in relief. You just say the word and I'll come running. Glad to know you're in my corner, she said, offering him a warm smile. And he trailed off, scratching the back of his head. Just like, so you know, if you need to talk, I'm happy to listen. Her smile widened. That's sweet of you, she replied. Thank you. He returned her smile, avoiding her direct gaze with a small blush on his cheeks. Slow down, she said suddenly, snapping him back to the task at hand. Something is off. Jeff let off the gas, and they slowed down, coming to a stop about a quarter mile from the intersection. On the northwest corner of the road sat a small building. It didn't look like a house, more like a single-story business of some kind that was boarded up. The two of them looked closely, seeing half a dozen bodies scattered about the front of the building. Either that's one hell of a coincidence that they all dropped dead in the same place, Jeff drawled, or someone has been there. Or is still there, Clara added. He nodded. Stay low in your seat as we approach, he instructed, just in case. She slunk down into the floorboards, and once she was secure, he inched the car up towards the structure. As he got closer, more of the intersecting street became visible, and there were multiple bodies scattered about that as well. He slammed on the brakes just short of the crossroads when two heavily armed older people came busting out the front door of the building. It was a man and a woman, both looking in their sixties, brandishing a rifle and a shotgun. Jeff slowly rolled down his window and popped open the door, 
reaching his hand out to show that they were empty. You stay in this car, he murmured. If they start shooting, get behind the wheel and drive. Should I avenge your death? Clara whispered. If you do, get Rufus to help, he replied. I need an explosion in my honor. She nodded as he cautiously got out of the vehicle, keeping his hands visible at all times. Boy, you'd better just get right back in that car and head back the way you came, the old man barked. Jeff nodded slowly. I'm happy to do that, he replied. But I need to talk to you first, sir. Bullshit, the man bellowed. Ain't nothing you can say that I'm going to be interested in. Jeff narrowed his eyes. Listen here, you old fuck, he snarled. If you don't want to get eaten, you're going to stand there for two minutes and listen to what I have to say. The man blinked in shock and then glanced at the woman next to him. She nodded, and the two of them lowered their weapons. You got two minutes, he said gruffly, and don't take another step towards us. Jeff motioned to the bodies everywhere. Now you seem to have managed okay up here, he said. But in a few hours, there are going to be thousands of those things coming right up the highway. Bullshit, boy, the man snapped. We're miles outside of that town. I know. I just made the drive up here, Jeff replied. I also know that there are a million of those things shambling up the I-10 as we speak. And in a few hours, we're bringing some up this way. The man raised his weapon, clenching his jaw. Pulling that trigger isn't going to stop what's coming, Jeff replied, keeping his hands raised. I'm just the scout, Bubba. Now, if you want to calm the fuck down... I can grab my map and show you exactly where we're leading these things so you and your woman there can make the necessary preparations. He shrugged. Or, if you want to be a prick and shoot me, you can become dinner. Your choice. The man looked at the woman, and she cocked her head. I'll keep my gun handy while he talks to you, she offered. He threw a casual wave at Jeff. Don't tell me you trust him, woman, he said. I think it can't hurt to listen she replied coolly. He begrudgingly slung his rifle over his shoulder, and the woman took several steps back, raising her gun. Well, go on then. Get your map, the man said. Jeff leaned back into the car, ducking his head to whisper to Clara, I'm not going to be long, and then we're getting the hell out of here. He grabbed the map and headed back out, walking over to the old man with his arms outstretched so he could see. These are the two main places we're going to pull some of those things off to, he said, pointing to the highway they were on, and the other main one coming out of town. How many you figure you're going to be bringing my way? the man asked. Jeff shook his head. Honestly, this is our first attempt at this, he admitted. But we're hoping to get a few thousand of them away from the main group. You ain't really giving me a whole lot of options on where to go, the man growled. Pretty sure you're aware that there ain't much around these parts. Jeff looked past him at the boarded up structure. How sturdy is this building? He asked. Strong as an ox, the old man replied, puffing out his chest. Cinder black frame with a wooden exterior. Take a hell of a lot to force it down. Jeff nodded. Now I don't know a lot about these things, he admitted, but I do know they're pretty stupid. Once they get moving in one direction, they'll keep going that way until they have a reason not to. If you and your old lady here can keep quiet, you might just be able to ride it out. Hell, I might give it a shot just to see what life is like with her being quiet for a chance, the man quipped. I will shoot you where you stand and dance on your cups, you miserable bastard, she called. Jeff chuckled and shook his head. Guessing you two don't entertain often, he said. In case you didn't notice, youngster, the woman barked, this shotgun is double-barreled. I'd watch your tone. He raised his palms in an apology. I appreciate you risking your behind coming up here to give us a heads up, the old man said, eyes sincere. I think we're going to take our chances and ride this thing out, unless you know of someplace safe we can go. I only know of three places where people are, Jeff admitted holding up his hand to count them off on his fingers. One threatens to shoot anybody who approaches them, one has been taken over by a drug cartel, and the other is caught between the cartel and the marching horde of death. If I wasn't afraid of your wife there, I'd be asking to hang out here for a few days. The old man chuckled. 
I think you might be the safe one. Here. Jeff folded up the map and smiled, extending his hand. You two be safe tonight, he said. If I'm still here in a week or so, I'll come up and check on you. I appreciate it, the man replied, shaking his hand with a firm grip. You be safe out there. Jeff nodded and gave a playful wave to the old woman, who just grunted in reply. He got back in the car, quickly started it up and threw it in reverse, doing a burnout to head back the way they came. Clara finally slithered back up into her seat. They seem fun, she quipped. Pretty sure that old guy was one bad joke away from catching a slug in the back of the head, Jeff replied, shaking his head. She shrugged with a sly grin. From the sounds of it, that might be preferable to being cooped up with that old woman. Let's promise to never be like them, he joked. Are you talking about being cranky or old? Clara asked with a laugh. Because I'm hardly the former, and I'll be shocked if we make it to the latter. Jeff barked a laugh. Nothing like a little optimism to brighten up my day. Chapter 4 Carlos pulled the SUV up to a stop at the fringe southern edge of town, about twenty yards away from the nearest building. In the distance were several dozen zombies milling about on the street and in parking lots, completely unaware of their presence. Javier was in the passenger seat with Trenton in the back, the former looked out towards the ghouls, keeping a close eye on them, while Trenton studied a map of the area to pinpoint their exact spot. Okay, we're a little bit to the east of the centre of town, he declared, which is good, because it isn't as developed over here. Javier nodded. So, how do you want to do this, man? he asked. Let's get the drone out and do a flyover of the area between here and the highway, Trenton replied. Just make sure to keep it on the far east side of town. Why's that? Javier asked. The younger man shook his head. Because we don't want to get the few thousand of those things near the center of town agitated, he explained. Then they'll be headed our way. Okay, east side it is, Javier replied, and got out of the car. Trenton followed, and they got the drone prepped. Within a few minutes, Javier fired it up and took off. It was a large commercial-grade drone with a high-resolution camera. The view screen on the controls was large enough for both of them to see it clearly. "'I'd get it pretty high and zoom in,' Trenton murmured. "'Should go a long way towards dispersing the noise.' Javier nodded and did so, rising the drone a few hundred feet in the air and zooming in with the camera so they could see a full block of space. "'You're the one doing this suicide run,' he said. "'So tell me what you're looking for.' Trenton took a deep breath. My plan is to draw as many of those things onto the highway as possible, put some distance between us, and set it up for the vehicle to keep moving forward, he explained. I'm going to take up shelter while they pass. We're less than a half mile from the highway, Javier said, raising an eyebrow. Why not just make a run for it back here and we'll pick you up? Trenton pointed to the view screen at all of the moving figures on the road. Because of that, he said, the roads are thick with those things so pushing through them is unlikely. Javier zoomed in on a sporting goods store. You could always go here and get you a crash helmet and some pads, he suggested. Just lower your head and run through them. Trenton chuckled. As much as I love football, I'm not exactly built for it, he admitted. His tentative partner cracked a smile and moved the drone towards the highway. As it flew, they spotted a two-story building three blocks south that was a standalone structure. Can you fly around that one? Trenton asked, and his partner complied, maneuvering the drone around so that the camera could get a good look at the building. As it circled around, they could see bars on the windows and front doors. The sign out front read, Michelle's Patisserie. What the hell is a patisserie? Javier asked. Trenton shrugged. Some French word. Pretty sure that's a cake shop. I could go for some cake, his partner moaned. So far, this is looking like the best option, Trenton replied with a smirk, so I can pick you up something if you like. Javier nodded, though he seemed hesitant. Despite their common enemy, both men knew there was intense pressure between them, and Javier wasn't so naive to think that Trenton viewed him as anything other than one of the bad guys. He continued to fly, circling the building to look for a way in. I don't see a way inside, he murmured. 
Trenton leaned over the screen and then pointed to a hatch on the roof. There it is, right there, he said. We get in from the top. If there isn't a visible entry point on the outside, it means it's likely safe inside. How are you getting up there, though? Javier asked. The younger man whirled a finger in the air. Fly around to the back, he instructed. Javier did so, and zoomed in on the back alley, which was wide enough for two cars to go through side by side. About halfway down was a ladder hanging several feet off of the ground, as well as a dozen or so zombies. That ladder will get me up there, Trenton declared. Then all I have to do is sit back and eat cake until the threat passes. Javier shook his head immediately. You're not getting up there alone, he insisted. This isn't my first rodeo, Trenton argued. I'll get up there just fine. I respect the confidence, his unlikely partner shot back, but I think I should come with you. Trenton shook his head. This guy is in the cartel. He'd have no qualms about feeding me to the zombies if he got the chance. Javier sighed. Look, I'm no fool, he said gently. I realize you see me as your enemy. And who knows, maybe I am. But not this week. There are more important things this week. That's a nice sentiment, but do you actually believe that? Trenton asked, cocking a brow. Your boss views me as expendable, so why should I believe you see me in any other way? Javier reached into his back pocket, pulling out a worn photograph of a little girl. This is my little girl, Rosa, he said, holding it up forcefully, making sure that Trenton could get a good look at it. She's four, and currently in El Paso. If we don't slow these things down and give both our communities time to prepare, we all lose. There aren't many of us out here confronting this problem, and quite frankly, if you have the balls to want to make this run yourself, then you're someone that needs to be around for the long haul. You have a better chance of succeeding if you have my help, and you know it. Trenton eyed him warily, but he knew the man was right. His chances of survival would go way up with someone fighting alongside him. He nodded reluctantly. Okay, you can come with me, he said, and then raised a hand. But just so we're clear, you're coming with me, not the other way around. I've been making runs like this for weeks, so you follow my lead. You good with that? Javier nodded, extending his hand to shake. Trenton stared at it for a moment, and then shook, taking a deep breath. Well, now that that's out of the way, let's figure out our best path through. He prompted, and they turned back to the screen. Javier flew it around, moving it over the highway to look back towards the target building. They scanned the area before the young man pointed out a building a block south of the road. Zoom in here, he said. As the camera focused, the building appeared as though it had been burned out from a massive fire. The front windows and door had been broken, the roof mostly caved in, and large metal displays were melted everywhere and left to rot. Doesn't look very secure to me, Javier said dryly. Trenton nodded. True, but it's wide open, and filled with things to trip those ghouls up, he said. His partner's eyes widened, and he nodded slowly as he caught the idea. I see what you're going for, he said. It's probably that we're going to have company when we're making our run. And cutting through there should buy us some time, Trenton added. Javier moved the camera to the back of the building, which was two blocks away from the target. There was a chain-link fence about eight feet high that led into a parking lot. About half a dozen zombies roamed about the lot, forever trapped inside. What about going over the fence? Javier asked. Trenton stared at it for a moment. Depends, he mused. Can you handle yourself in a fight with those things? Javier smirked, reaching down to his boot and pulling out a machete. I think I can manage, he declared. Looks like we have our path, then, his partner replied with a firm nod. Carlos rolled down the window from the front seat of the SUV, poking his head out. Boss wants us back at the meet-up spot, he called. Or do you need more time? I'm good if you are, Trenton said. Javier nodded and turned to Carlos. Tell him we're on the way, he instructed, and then piloted the drone back so they could load up. As it flew in their direction and got lower to the ground, a few zombies several blocks up got a look at it and wandered into the street. Trenton looked towards them but not concerned since they were far enough away for them to get going without incident. As the drone landed, Javier grabbed it and then glanced at the approaching zombies. Doesn't take a lot to get them interested, does it? he asked. Trenton shook his head. Let's hope it stays that way, because we need to make a lot of things disappear. Chapter 
Chapter 5 Carlos drove down a back road leading to the highway. It was more of a dirt bike trail than an actual road, so everyone inside bounced around. After several minutes of bumpy driving, they came to a highway just south of the meeting spot. He made the turn, and they drove up, seeing one of the cartel members standing behind the caravan of vehicles with a charcoal grill set up, flipping over tortillas and portioning them between several small pans. "'Wasn't aware we were grilling out today,' Trenton muttered. Javier shrugged. "'Well, we have the means and the time, so might as well take advantage of it,' he replied. "'Can't argue with that.' Trenton admitted. Carlos parked the SUV and the three of them got out, walking over to the rest of the group. Rodriguez headed over once he noticed they had arrived. Trenton, are you prepared? he asked. Yeah, Javier and I know what we're doing, Trenton replied with a nod. Rodriguez cocked his head, regarding the other cartel member. Javier? he asked. The man in question shrugged. You know how careless these Americans are, he joked. Figured I would tag along to make sure he doesn't get himself eaten. Rodriguez nodded appreciatively and patted him on the shoulder to show him he was impressed by him stepping up. You have an hour before they reach the interchange, he said. So eat up, get prepared, take whatever you need from the supply truck. As the duo walked away, Angel appeared with a few others flanking him. My job's done. I'm going home, he declared. Rodriguez glared at him and then jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Fine. Get out of here, he snapped. Just be ready to work in the morning. Angel rolled his eyes as he sauntered away. He led his little trio towards a vehicle, close to where Jeff and Clara were having a bite to eat. The younger Reva smirked and turned towards them, leering at the young woman. I'll see you soon, princess, he drawled, throwing her a wink and an air kiss. Jeff grinned. Looking forward to it, cupcake, he said loudly. Just know I'm hung like a horse and not a fan of lube, so you might not enjoy it as much as you think you will. He gave the horrified-looking cartel boss the same kind of smarmy wink and kiss he doled out. Angel growled and made to lunge forward, but his lackeys held him back. You're on my list, he screamed, shaking off his men and pointing at Jeff. I'm honored, the skinhead drawled, rolling his eyes. Angel threw another glare over his shoulder as his men shoved him into his car before they sped off towards El Paso. Clara gave her friend a sheepish look. Thank you, she said quietly. His face sobered when he realized how rattled she looked, and he leaned forward. Hey, just in case you were concerned about what I just said, he began in a low, serious tone. Let me put your mind at ease. I am a fan of lube. Clara spit out her mouthful of taco, bursting into laughter. That, she said as she regained her composure, that is good to know. Sparks and Rufus grabbed some food from the grillmaster, inspecting it. Three kinds of beans, some mystery meat, and jalapenos, Rufus said. I've certainly eaten worse, just a shame there's no cheese. The grillmaster didn't say anything but raised a finger at him. He walked away to the trunk of a nearby car, popping it open and reaching into a styrofoam cooler. He pulled out the smallest plastic bag of cheese they'd ever seen and tossed it over. Enjoy, gringo, he said thickly, as Rufus snatched it out of the air. The old man chuckled and gave him a nod, and Sparks led him over to sit with Clara and Jeff. What did y'all find up north? Sparks asked. Jeff swallowed his mouthful and raised his chin. Couple of gun happy old timers about five miles outside of town, but that was about it, he replied. They evacuate? Rufus asked as he took a seat. No, they're staying put, Jeff replied, shaking his head. They're in a secure building, so I think they'll be okay. I told them if we survive this, I'll go check on them next week. Clara licked some grease off of one of her fingers and turned to Sparks. So how did it go on the interstate? We maybe dropped a thousand of them, came the reply. But between burning and blowing them up, I think we may have bought a half hour or so. Jeff rolled his eyes. Oh, good. So by my calculation, we just need a hundred and eighty-seven thousand cars to completely eliminate them. Unfortunately, we have six days, Rufus said, not six months. If we make it through this, we really need to stock up on explosive cars in case this happens again, Jeff declared, just saying. Rufus grinned. You know me. I'll never turn down an opportunity to blow shit up, he said. 
when are we headed up to the interstate to divert what we can? Clara asked. Sparks swallowed a mouthful of food. Rufus and I are heading out in a few minutes, she explained. But I need you two to head back to town. Why? Jeff asked, blinking at her. Wouldn't we be useful? You would be, but I need you to deliver a message to our hidden friends, she said quietly. She looked around, making sure that no body was within earshot before leaning in. Tell them that the target is a three-story building two blocks east of City Hall. Don't have a way in yet, but it is being worked on. Clara nodded. I can handle it, she said. Turning to Jeff, if you want to stay and help out here. Nah, you're not going anywhere by yourself as long as that rapey-eyed asshole is roaming free, Jeff declared, and a small smile broke out on her face. Rufus raised a hand. Now, he may look like a giant bald teddy bear, he declared. But let me assure you that he can throw down when necessary. Uh, thanks, I guess, Jeff replied, raising an eyebrow. Rufus winked at him. Just trying to be a good wingman, he said, smacking Jeff on the arm as he walked away to dispose of his plate. You two be safe, Sparks said. We'll see you back in Fabens. She headed off to join Rufus, and the two remaining finished off their food, getting to their feet. They dumped their plates in a haphazard garbage bag next to one of the trucks. As they drove off, Rodriguez turned to Sparks. Is everything okay? Yeah, they just had an errand to run, she replied casually, and his brow furrowed but then smoothed out when he realized what she was saying. Okay, then, he replied. We should get packed up and get in position. That horde will be on us before we know it. He looked back at the grillmaster. Make sure you dump those coals in the road, he instructed. We have enough going out here without worrying about wildfires. The chef nodded and began to clean up as Rodriguez headed over to his truck. Sparks and Rufus hopped in the back, sitting up against the window, as Rodriguez got into the passenger seat with his driver. "'You good back there?' he asked through the open window. "'Let's do it!' Sparks called back, and the truck roared to life, heading out with Javier and Trenton in the SUV behind them. Once the grillmaster finished cleaning up, He and two others hopped into the last SUV to join the caravan as they began to head to the interstate up north. The battle was soon to begin. Chapter 6 Clara and Jeff slowed down about a quarter mile away from the turnoff, pulling over to the side of the road. What's up? Clara asked. He stared straight ahead before reaching into the back seat for a hunting rifle and she swallowed hard. "'Jeff, what's wrong?' she demanded. He shook his head. "'Nothing that I can see,' he replied. "'But I just want to make sure.' He got out of the car, aiming the rifle straight down the highway, looking past the town and scanning for any movement. After a few moments he was satisfied that they were alone, so he got back in. Clara raised an eyebrow at him as he put the gun into the back seat. Just making sure that asshole wasn't going to spy on us, he explained, raising his palms. He doesn't strike me as the type to be smart enough to think that we might stop here, but I can't say the same about his friends. She smiled softly. Better safe than sorry, right? she asked. Exactly, he replied with a firm nod. They started driving again, heading up to their target road and making the turn. As they headed towards the building with the radio in it, Clara looked towards the roadblock at the end of the street, which was now free of bodies. Guess the stench was getting to be too much for them, she murmured. Jeff shrugged. Or they knew that the cartel was going to be in the vicinity and didn't want to take the chance of being discovered, he suggested. Suppose that works too, she agreed. He winced when he realized that he'd dismissively corrected her, and she laughed when she spotted the look on his face. Don't worry, I'm not offended, she assured him and he breathed a sigh of relief. They pulled up to the building, stopping alongside the curb. They got out of the car, and she raised an eyebrow at him. The radio is just inside there. I think I can manage, she said, jerking a thumb over her shoulder. He shot her a lopsided grin. We can just chalk it up to me wanting to stretch my legs, he suggested. If it'll make me sound less like a hovering guardian angel. Clara chuckled and shook her head as the two of them headed for the front door. The building seemed to be a small storefront that had the door removed. They walked in and did a quick sweep of the place, assuming that it was empty but not wanting to take anything for granted. I'll watch the door, Jeff offered. She nodded. 
should only be a minute or two, she said, and walked over to the register desk. She looked around and finally found the radio nestled into the back of one of the shelves. She picked it up, fiddling with the dial. Jeff looked out into the town as Clara spoke into every channel waiting for a response. He tuned her out, contemplating how airy it was to see Martha completely devoid of life. Dread rose in his gut at the sound of a rumbling car engine. He peeked around the corner of the doorframe, looking towards the highway. Several blocks up was the car that Angel and his crew had left in earlier. Shit, fuck, fuck, he muttered. Clara paused and looked over at him. What's wrong? she asked. It's Angel, he said. I want you to stay behind that counter. You understand? She nodded and ducked down, raising the radio to her lips. I need to go radio silent for a few minutes, she said. Everything is under control. I'll be back. Copy that, Andrew replied. Jeff watched as the car rolled slowly down the road and wondered if they were trying to ratchet up the tension on purpose. He hated to admit to himself that it was working. They parked about ten yards away from his vehicle, and he watched from behind cover as they got out. Once he had a good idea of where everybody was, with Angel on the driver's side and the other two on the passenger's side, he stepped outside. "'Didn't realize you were that anxious for our date there, Cupcake,' he drawled. Angel sneered. "'You got a big mouth on you there,' he spat. "'Better be careful, because it can get you in a whole lot of trouble, especially since we're the only ones here.' He cocked his head. Or are we? Don't worry, Jeff replied with a flippant sigh. I'm more than enough for you. Angel wagged a finger at him. If I didn't know any better, I would swear you were up to something, he said. Why would you bother to stop in this small town in the middle of nowhere? It's a long drive, the skinhead replied with a casual shrug. When nature calls, I tend to answer. The younger Riva scoffed. What kind of man are you? he asked, spreading his arms. Look around. The world is your bathroom. You may like shoving a tumbleweed up your ass, Jeff said, and raised his palm. And to be clear, I'm not knocking you on that because I don't kink shame. But I prefer toilet paper. Angel narrowed his eyes and then glanced at his friends. I don't know about you two, but I don't buy it, he said. I say we see what's going on. The other let out excited noises in the affirmative, stepping forward. Jeff took the invitation, stalking towards them with menace in his eyes. He cracked his knuckles and the group stopped about five feet away as he towered over them, broad shoulders rippling muscle. So, which one of you wants to eat through a straw for the next six months, huh? He asked, regarding each one in turn. What about you? You want to blend up a taco in order to eat? Or you? Maybe I'd break your back and see how you fare in the wheelchair against those things. He looked at Angel. Well, what about you? You smell that? He sniffed loudly, exaggerating the movement. Sounds like your boys over there pissed themselves once they got a good look at me up close. You really want to try taking me on with these two pussies as your only backup? The three men stood there, seeming to wither under Jeff's malicious stare. And finally Angel snapped his fingers. Let's go. He's not worth our time, he spat. Jeff stared them down as they backed away, got back in their car, and sped off back towards the highway. When the vehicle disappeared in the distance, he let out a deep sigh of relief, shoulders slumping. Clara emerged seconds later. That was intense, she said. He whirled around, chewing his lip. I'm... I'm sorry you had to hear that, he blurted. Don't be, she assured him putting a hand on his arm. You de-escalated the situation by escalating it. She paused, confusion on her face at the way the words had come out of her mouth. Jeff laughed. I totally understand what you meant there, he said, relaxing. Well, good, she replied with a chuckle, as long as one of us did. You should probably finish your call, he suggested, inclining his head towards the building. We should start heading back soon, so we don't attract any more suspicion from them. I'll make it quick she assured him, and turned to head back inside. Jeff took a step towards her. Oh, and Clara? he asked. Yeah? she asked, turning back around. He grinned. I'm totally going to punch that motherfucker in the ribs while I hold him down for you, he declared. She smiled and shook her head. I'm good with that. 
Chapter 7 Javier and Trenton sat in their SUV, staring down the interstate towards the horde, which was less than a mile away. Beside them was the truck with Rodriguez and the others, the third SUV sitting on the other side of that. You know where you're picking us up, right? Trenton asked through the open window. Rufus laughed. Just hang out in the corner and show a little leg, he joked. We'll find you. Spark smacked his arm playfully, rolling her eyes, and leaned over him. Yeah, we know, she assured Trenton. We'll come get the two of you once they pass. Figure it'll be at least a couple of hours. Take your time, Javier said. We're going to be surrounded by tasty treats. Trenton grinned. I see that look on your face, Rufus, and don't worry, he said, raising a hand. And don't worry, I'll bring you some cake. Damn right you will, the old man replied with a smirk. You boys be safe. We'll see you soon, Sparks added. The two vehicles started up and headed towards the interstate, which looped around the northern part of town. Trenton and Javier sat and stared down the road towards the lumbering horde, both of them transfixed on the mass of rotting flesh moving as one. You're beginning to think we made a mistake volunteering for this? Trenton asked. Javier nodded slowly. Oh, a hundred percent, he admitted. Trenton let out a dark laugh in response to the deadpan line. Glad it's not just me, he said. Still, even though we had made what is quite possibly the worst decision of our lives by being here, I'm at peace with it, Javier said, cocking his head. Because I know we're going to do this job right, and I can't say the same for some of the other people in my camp. Hear, hear, Trenton added, and extended his fist. Javier bumped it with his own, and then the two of them sat in silence for a few more minutes as the horde marched closer. Trenton looked over his shoulder out the back window towards the exit, which led down a slight embankment to the surface street highway, about fifty yards away. Okay, we're looking clear behind us on the exit, he said. Javier reached down underneath the driver's seat, tugging on the rope tied to the bottom of it to make sure it was secure. Automated driver is good to go, too he replied. They sat for another few moments, staring out the window at the lumbering horde. He finally fired up the vehicle and did a three-point turn, setting them up in the middle of the road. Trenton reached up and opened the sunroof, before grabbing the assault rifle from the back seat. You remember the jumping-off point, right? he asked. We lead them for ten blocks, then speed up for two, and make a run for it, Javier confirmed. Trenton nodded and got up from his seat maneuvering around so he could stand up through the sunroof. Once he was in position, the zombies were closer, within twenty yards, many of them moaning and growling and snarling when they realized there was a fresh meal ahead. He waited patiently, knowing that he needed to time it just right. He took aim through the rifle scope, honing in on a large male ghoul that was missing several chunks of flesh from its face. Start moving on my signal, he said. Javier gave him a light tap on the leg to let him know that he'd gotten the message. Trenton continued to aim, waiting until the zombies were within ten yards, his palms beginning to sweat at the sheer enormity of the horde that stretched on for miles, vanishing over the horizon. He finally squeezed the trigger, sending a round through the forehead of the target zombie. It only took a few seconds before the body was swallowed up by the mass. He aimed at the next one, having to pause and adjust as the SUV lurched forward slowly. Javier kept it moving at a shuffling zombie's pace, his foot on the brake so it would only crawl at a couple of miles per hour, to keep them the exact buffer of space between the vehicle and horde. Trenton tried to aim and take another ghoul down, but the SUV ride wasn't the smoothest, making accurate aim impossible. He quickly gave up on shooting them in the head, knowing that the noise part was more important than killing one zombie in a million-strong horde. He switched to pulling the trigger every couple of seconds, attempting more to trip them up and keeping a steady stream of noise in the air. The ghouls in the front of the pack began to get agitated as they lumbered forward, reaching out for a prey that was continuously just out of reach. Javier tapped him on the leg to get his attention. Exit in thirty seconds, he said. Trenton gave him a thumbs up and returned to firing. He started pulling the trigger as fast as he could, knowing this was their last chance to pull the creatures off of the interstate. He burned through a magazine and quickly reloaded, dropping the empty one down into the SUV. 
The vehicle began to drift over towards the exit, and Trenton gave it all he had, firing round after round to make as much noise as he could. Bullets ripped through the front line of the ghouls, causing little more than superficial damage. As the vehicle began down the slight decline of the exit, hundreds of zombies veered off to follow them. It's working! Trenton exclaimed, and then resumed firing, drawing ghouls away from the main pack to follow them onto the surface street highway. The SUV reached the bottom of the exit ramp that was now completely filled with ghouls, though were easily several hundred, with more lining up behind them. For a brief moment, Trenton allowed himself to believe that all the zombies would follow. Maybe, just maybe, they'd be able to end this threat with a single shot. The hopeful belief was short-lived, however. The SUV was a block and a half away from the exit before his heart sank. The stream of zombies from the highway had stopped. Fuck! he cried. Javier startled, smacking his leg hard. What? We only got a few thousand of them, Trenton replied. Javier let out a deep sigh. He too was disheartened that they'd only pulled that many, but his original panic had been that they were in mortal danger. At least, more than they already were. He shook his head. Trenton looked back at the interstate which curved to the north, and watched helplessly as the overwhelming majority of the horde continued to trudge along. He aimed towards the top of the exit, which was several blocks away at that point, and began firing. He managed to strike a few zombies in the side as they walked by, but the majority of them ignored the bullets. A couple looked around like they were confused, but were quickly shoved along by the horde, like a leaf falling into a stream. Trenton sighed as the horde ignored his efforts and changed his attention back to the problem at hand, the ones that had followed. How are we looking? Javier asked from inside. Trenton shook his head. Two, maybe three thousand followed us, he replied. That's it? the driver asked, and it was less to his companion and more just in disbelief to the heavens. The rest just pushed on down the interstate, Trenton replied, rubbing his forehead. Javier sighed and then perked up as zombies began to pour out of the side streets. Contact! Three o'clock! he yelled. Trenton swung around and spotted a few dozen ghouls coming out of one street, attracted by the noise. He took aim, but waited until they were within reach to fire. He scanned up to the next block, seeing dozens more coming out from between buildings and the next side street. How much farther do we have? he barked. Four more blocks before we break out, Javier called back. Six to the turn. Trenton stared up the road as their escape route began to close. He froze for a second, unsure of what their best option was. Fuck it, he muttered, and then yelled, Floor it! Javier didn't need to be asked twice, and hit the gas. The quick acceleration caught Trenton off guard, flinging him around the sunroof. It took a moment, but he finally regained his footing, keeping his focus on the threat ahead. The SUV sped down the road as zombies poured out from the side streets, getting closer and closer to the vehicle. One more block! Javier bellowed. Trenton spotted a dozen zombies on the next block that had made their way to the centre of the street, a good twenty yards away from the other. "'When you stop, get the driver set up and I'll cover,' he cried. Javier reached the target block, with a couple of the dozen ghouls standing in the middle of the road. He floored it just a bit to smack hard into the duo, sending the corpses flying back several yards to smack down onto the pavement. After that, he slammed on the brakes, sending his companion lurching forward from the momentum. As soon as they were at a standstill, Javier started working on tying the rope to the steering wheel to make sure it would drive relatively straight along the road. While he was doing this, Trenton took aim and opened fire. He carefully selected his targets, aiming and squeezing the trigger to send round after round through the creature's heads. He picked off a few near the front of the vehicle and then startled as three of them smacked into the driver's side door. Am I good? Javier yelled from beneath the steering wheel. Trenton adjusted his aim, shooting each of the three zombies quickly at near point-blank range to drop them harmlessly to the ground. Yeah, you're good, he called back. Javier continued working on securing the steering wheel as Trenton continued to pump out round after round into zombies' heads. After several tense moments, the immediate area around the SUV was clear and the vehicle was rigged up for launch. On the move, 
Javier yelled and jumped out of the driver's side, drawing his handgun to scan the area for any immediate threat that they may have drawn towards them. Cover! he called and took over gun duty, shooting several bullets towards the back of the vehicle. He struck a few zombies making their way around it to get to them as Trenton clambered up onto the roof. He slid down the front windshield, landing hard on the ground, and firing a few more rounds down the street as even more ghouls emerged. Set it loose! he yelled. Javier ducked back inside the vehicle, pulling the handbrake hard before tossing a brick onto the gas pedal. The engine whined loudly as the SUV picked up a little speed, but with the handbrake it didn't go very fast. The duo quickly stood side by side behind it, glancing back towards the horde which was picking up new members as they shambled by the side streets. Catching the newcomers and sweeping them along in their river of death, "'We gotta move,' Trenton said, noting the horde a block away. They began to jog up the road, keeping pace with the SUV that was ten yards ahead. A few zombies stepped up to attack the vehicle, only to be knocked back to the ground. The men paid them no attention, rather leaping over them and continuing to run towards the turnoff a block and a half up. When they reached the next intersection, they spotted several dozen ghouls emerging from the side street, causing them to stop dead in their tracks. "'We aren't making it through that,' Javier said, eyes widening. Trenton glanced down another side street, seeing about ten or so zombies stretched out over the next block. He threw his rifle over his shoulder and pulled out a large hunting knife from his boot. This is our turn, then, he declared. We'll cut up the next block to get to the burned-out building. Javier followed his lead, holstering his handgun and switching to his machete as well. Silence was going to be of the essence here to make sure the horde wouldn't pull off of the main highway. If they did, and filtered into the city streets, then it would be all but impossible for them to be rescued. They raced down the street towards the ten or so ghouls spread out. Neither of them stopped to attack, rather lowering their shoulders to bowl the corpses over. Trenton stumbled a bit after ramming into his, and another managed to grab tightly onto the back of his shirt as he slowed down. He struggled to break free, swinging wildly, but was unable to reach behind him all the way. Javier came in swinging, bringing his machete forcefully down onto the wrist of the zombie, severing the rotted hand. He gave the rest of the corpse a forceful kick in the side, sending it careening out of the way. Trenton gave him a quick nod of thanks, and they took off running once again. They made the turn at the next intersection. Rushing down the road, there were twenty creatures at the far end that slowly made their way up towards the highway, attracted by the grinding of the emergency parking brake as the SUV moved up the highway. There were only a couple of ghouls on the side street, neither of which paid the two running men any attention. Trenton motioned for Javier to follow him, and they moved to the sidewalk, pressing up against the buildings as close as they could to help conceal them. Halfway up the block, they stopped, watching the two zombies on the road wander up to the group headed towards the highway, joining them. There was a brief gap of monsters on the next road, so the men picked up the pace and sprinted in that direction seeing their opening to get across the burned-up building. They reached the intersection with the mangled building on the southern corner across the way. They paused briefly to survey the situation. Unfortunately, it seemed as if their footsteps had been a little too loud, as several zombies turned around, moaning, heading back towards them. Fuck, Trenton muttered. The gap between the packs was small, but the moans alerted the back group to their presence. The duo didn't speak or look at each other, simply by reflex darted out from their hiding spot and raced across the street. Several dozen creatures turned their attention towards the running men, moving towards them in unison. As they reached the entrance of the burned building, a long creature came out right in front of Trenton. He reacted quickly, by instinct, thrusting his hunting knife upwards to catch the zombie underneath the chin. He shoved it up hard, piercing its brain, and then tore it back down, kicking the corpse aside so they could enter the building. The terrain inside was rough, much rougher than they had seen through the drone view. Most of the roof had collapsed, with several wooden beams splintered and sticking up in multiple places, making it difficult to navigate. This was hard for them, but ultimately what they'd wanted to achieve to slow down any pursuers. As they slowly worked their way through, zombies poured in through the front of the building. When Trenton reached the centre of the room, he put his hand on Javier's shoulder to get him to stop. At first the cartel member was confused, brow furrowing, 
but then contemplated for a moment, and then nodded. It made sense to lure as many of the zombies as they could inside before making a break for it. The other unspoken agreement was that neither of them wanted to speak, for fear of pulling the horde outside to the back door, which was their escape route. The ghouls had a tough time working their way through, and the duo started smirking, watching their enemies fall over themselves. One zombie managed to get its foot caught on a beam and toppled forward, impaling itself through the chest on a particularly large spike. The one behind it lost its balance and fell backwards, knocking down several others in the process. When the group was about five yards away, Trenton motioned for Javier to leave, and they turned, navigating the rest of the room as quickly and quietly as they could to the back door. When they reached it, they took a beat, looking back at the ghouls that had reached the centre part of the room. Trenton took a deep breath, preparing himself for what might be on the other side of the door, even though they couldn't hear anything outside. He held up three fingers, doing a slow and silent countdown, and then threw open the door. There was a loud thump as the metal door smacked into a zombie's face, knocking it back onto the ground. The two men burst out into the alley, and Javier gently shut the door behind them, making sure it latched. Trenton lunged forward, stabbing the fallen zombie in the face, and then surveying the area. The fence they were going to climb was less than ten yards away, but there were a few ghouls milling about, suddenly very interested in the fresh meal. The duo quickly leapt into action, stabbing and slashing at the creatures to cut them down to size, buying them enough time to scale the fence. Trenton stabbed one directly in the eye, sending the corpse convulsing to the ground. Javier slashed sideways with his machete, taking a head clean off at the neck. When they were left with nothing but a pile of limbs and bodies, the coast relatively clear, the duo ran for the chain-link fence. They secured their blades and got to work, managing to scale to the top relatively quickly. At the top, they flipped over, leaping down into the grass below. When they hit the ground, Javier stumbled forward, face planting into the grass. Trenton dove for him, grabbing his arm to help him up. "'Are you hurt?' he whispered. Javier shook his head as he wiped himself off. "'Just my pride,' he murmured. Trenton smirked, patting him on the shoulder, and they took stock of the lot. They began a slow saunter across, relishing the brief moment of peace before they have to make a final push to the target building. The fence skirted completely around the large lot, connecting to a small one-story building in the centre. The grass was overgrown, looking like it hadn't been maintained properly, even before the apocalypse. The duo looked through the other side of the fence, watching as several dozen zombies shambled towards the highway, most of them oblivious to the men inside. Trenton reached the building first, peering in through a small, dirty window to find it empty inside. Javier gently turned the doorknob, blinking in surprise when it opened. He held it shut as Trenton raised his fingers again for a silent countdown and when he got to zero, Javier threw the door open. They rushed inside, and Trenton moved in to do a quick sweep of the building, as Javier secured the door. Before long, they reconvened at the front, looking out the window. The two-story baker was in the lot across the street from them, a good thirty yards away from one door to another. There were dozens of ghouls in the road, most of them were thankfully working their way north towards the highway but there were still plenty of gaps between them. "'You think we can make it?' Trenton murmured. Javier took a deep breath. "'Half tempted to just stay here,' he admitted. His companion shook his head and pointed to the front door, a flimsy wooden thing with some holes in it. "'One of those things decides to come our way and we'd be screwed,' he said. "'That door couldn't hold back a chihuahua.' "'Yeah, you're right,' Javier admitted, scratching his chin. "'So which side of the building you want to head towards?' he asked. Trenton looked down the side street as much as he could from inside the window. There were several zombies towards the closest street, but he was unable to see much of anything in the other direction. Well, we know what we're dealing with if we go left, he mused. If we go right, we could be in the clear or be totally overwhelmed. Javier grinned. Question is, are you a gambling man or not? he asked. Trenton shrugged. I've been on half a dozen blind dates in the last year he said. His companion nodded. Gambling it is, he said, raising a victory fist. They looked out the window again, waiting for their moment to move, blades at the ready. 
Finally, there was a break, and they threw open the door, quickly racing out to the right. They shoved their way past a couple of zombies near the building, knocking them to the ground. When they reached the road, they looked to the right and quickly realized they'd made a terrible mistake. Nearly fifty zombies were in the road, all of which turned their snarling heads towards the two living men. They froze for a brief moment before Javier grabbed Trenton by the shirt and dragged him towards the building. The ghouls gained ground, converging towards them and almost cutting them off from being able to get around them. The men pumped their legs as hard as they could, barely getting by the outstretched hands of the zombies, scraping their shoulders on the brick corner as they came around. They moved quickly down the side of the building, with Trenton glancing over his shoulder to see the zombies quickly filtering in behind them. Javier was in the lead, running towards the back of the building. When he was nearly there, a ghoul staggered around the corner. He raised his machete while running, bringing it down forcefully onto the top of the corpse's head. He used the momentum to shove the zombie forward, clearing their path to the back of the building. The ladder was fifteen yards away, with only a few undead enemies standing in their way. They rushed it, taking time to dispatch the ghouls that were in their way, stabbing and slashing, making sure they weren't going to be grabbed while they were climbing. Once clear, Javier got into a crouching position beneath the ladder, which was several feet above the ground. The bottom rung about as high as a basketball rim. Come on, move! he screamed, cupping his hands so that Trenton could get a boost. He sheathed his knife and darted forward, planting his foot into the handstep, and leaping up, grabbing onto the bottom rung of the ladder. He climbed up a few spots, stopping to look back at his companion still on the ground. Javier backed up, getting ready to make a running leap for it. Trenton shook his head. He's never going to make it, he muttered, and shoved his arm through the ladder rung, securing himself as best he could, leaving his legs dangling several feet below the bottom. Grab onto me, he cried. Javier tore towards him as the zombies closed in, planting his foot on the wall and using it to propel himself upwards. He wrapped his arms around Trenton's knees and made quick work of climbing him to get to the ladder. He hooked a leg up awkwardly onto the rung next to his companion's thighs. It took several moments to maneuver his limbs around Trenton's hanging body, but Javier finally managed to get above him and begin climbing. Once clear, Trenton hissed as he disentangled his arm from the rung, and it screamed, strained from holding up an entire adult man. He looked down, seeing a pack of zombies below, reaching and snapping and desperate for him to fall into their gaping mouths. He hooked up one of his legs, using his feet to propel him up the ladder, curling his injured arm to his chest and using his good one to struggle to clamber up. Once he got closer to the roof, Javier popped up over the side, holding out his arms. "'Come on, I got you,' he said, and grabbed a hold of Trenton's good arm. They heaved up over the side of the roof and collapsed back onto the flat concrete, chests heaving. "'Are you okay?' Javier huffed, turning his head to look at his companion. Trenton hissed as he tried to lift his arm and nodded jerkily. "'Nothing some icy hot and a shot of Jack won't fix,' he said. "'Not sure we're going to find that in here,' Javier replied, chuckling. His companion shrugged with the shoulder that wasn't in pain. "'You never know,' he replied shakily. Bakers can be alcoholics, too. This is a true statement, Javier admitted with a nod, and sat up. What do you say we get in there and see what we can find? Trenton suggested, groaning as he rolled onto his side to push himself up. First thing is first, his companion said, and got to his feet looking around the empty rooftop. He strode over to the air conditioner, finding a small pile of metal debris on the other side. He picked up a thick piece and reared back throwing it as hard as he could towards the highway. Several seconds later, there was the unmistakable clang of metal on pavement echoing through the air. He repeated the process several times before backing away from the edge. Trenton joined him, and they watched the zombies around the building move away from the back and head towards the noise, rejoining the horde moving towards the highway. From their vantage point, it was difficult to get a good look but they could see what appeared to be a stream of zombies still going after the slow-moving SUV. They nodded and let out deep breaths, relieved at having done their jobs. You did good out there, Trenton said. Javier gave him a small smile. You as well, he replied. And thank you for saving my life on the ladder. Any time, his companion replied. They watched for a few moments in silence. 
Trenton finally let out a big sigh. I wish we could have gotten more of them off of the interstate, he said. Javier nodded. Perhaps the others will have better luck than we did. Chapter 8 Rodriguez, Rufus, and Sparks watched from their vehicle as a couple thousand zombies poured off of the interstate, following Javier and Trenton. Their disappointment quickly set in when they saw the breakaway group end. Well, that was a colossal waste of fucking time, Rufus muttered. Sparks shook her head. We still have another shot at them, she insisted. If we're only peeling off a couple thousand at a time, we're going to need a few hundred exits between here and El Paso, the old man argued. She opened her mouth to respond, but then closed it again, shaking her head. There was no room for pointless platitudes. He was right. Rufus, how is your back? Rodriguez asked suddenly. The old man raised an eyebrow. Um, he trailed off, and then shrugged. Fine, I guess. Good, because I have an idea, Rodriguez replied, and then whistled loudly out the window, gaining the attention of the other vehicle with two cartel members inside. He started the truck and began driving down the interstate, moving quickly and leaving the marching horde in their wake. It only took a few minutes to reach the highway turn-off target, and he slammed on the brakes just past it. The other vehicle did the same, parking right behind them. Rodriguez sprung out of the truck, moving with manic purpose. What's the hurry? Rufus asked as he opened his door. I figure we have forty, maybe forty-five minutes before they arrive here, which gives us scant time to act, Rodriguez replied. Sparks joined him, cocking her head. What's your plan? He motioned just off the exit. We're going to push some of those cars up here and create a barricade he said, pointing to several businesses with cars parked in the lot. My men will still try to pull them off of the highway, but with the added cars it might deter them and force them to follow. Rufus and Sparks stared at the few dozen zombies across the parking lots and then looked at each other and shrugged. Hell, I've heard worse ideas, Rufus admitted. We're here, so might as well give it a shot. Sparks nodded, and the two of them joined Rodriguez to wait for the others. The cartel member whistled again, getting the attention of the men in the car. "'Clear the path for us!' he yelled, pointing to the parking lot. One of them waved back at him, and the SUV sped off down the ramp. "'It will take them a moment,' Rodriguez said, motioning for his companions to follow him on foot. "'So we might as well enjoy this nice day.' The trio walked over to the off-ramp and began descending down the slight decline as they walked towards the highway below. Gunfire erupted in the distance. They could see the two madmen driving around the parking lots, honking the horn to get the attention of the ghouls. They'd stop beside them and open fire, essentially doing a mass drive-by shooting. They circled several times, Rufus and Sparks watching on with some sense of amusement. The men would occasionally leave a zombie standing during the excitement of wiping out a batch of them, so they'd reverse course running over the stragglers before moving on to the next batch. It was almost like watching kids play a shoot 'em up video game. They seem to enjoy their work, Rufus drawled. Rodriguez chuckled. Yes, Juan and Antonio have been going a little stir-crazy being cooped up in El Paso, he admitted. So when they heard of this suicide mission, they volunteered rather quickly. They haven't been able to have this much fun since we took over the town. Are they loyal to you? Sparks asked, crossing her arms. To me? he asked, and then shook his head. No, they are not. However, they aren't particularly loyal to Tiago, either. Indifferent is a good description. As long as they get to spread chaos, they are content. Unattached lunatics are better to have around than anybody loyal to the opposition, I suppose, Rufus mused. Rodriguez nodded. Especially these guys, he replied. I've seen them take on entire strike teams and leave them in pieces without breaking a sweat. They were nearly to the bottom of the ramp when the boys finished off the last remaining zombie in the immediate area. They backed up their SUV to a vehicle in the lot and both jumped out. Juan opened the back hatch and pulled out a chain, attaching it to the rear of their vehicle before attaching the other side to the front of the car. Antonio, meanwhile, walked over to the driver's side window 
smashing it out with the butt of his handgun, reaching in and putting the car into neutral. The group stepped out of the way as the men dragged the car up the ramp, getting it into position on the interstate. Rodriguez walked up to another car in the same lot, smashing out the window and opening the door. He looked for the keys in the sun blocker, but there weren't any there. Sparks raised an eyebrow at him curiously. What? he asked sheepishly, shrugging. There's always a set there in your American movies. She chuckled and shook her head as he popped it into neutral. He got out, unlocking the doors as he did so. Sparks opened the passenger side, getting behind the door, and Rufus put his hands on the trunk. Let's get it moving, Rodriguez said, and the trio pushed. The car began to move pretty easily, and Rodriguez reached in to steer it towards the on-ramp. Just before they got there, the other two drove back by them, on their way to pick up another car. It took them a few minutes, but they got it in position on the interstate, bumper to bumper with the other. A few more of these, and we might just be in business, Rufus huffed. Sparks checked her watch. We're going to have to hurry, though, she urged. That clock is ticking down fast. A half an hour later, the trio pushed up one final car, putting it in position to finish off the makeshift barricade six cars long and two deep. They stood there to appraise their work, sweaty and breathing heavily, worn out from the excursion. Let's hope this works, Rufus declared, brushing sweat-slicked hair back from his forehead. I'd hate to go through that much exercise for nothing. Sparks smirked at him. You could always just chalk it up to doing it for your health, she teased. That's what the whiskey is for, Rufus insisted. Sparks and Rodriguez cracked a smile, and then glanced down the interstate, seeing the horde coming into the hundred-yard buffer. Juan and Antonio pulled up on the other side of the barricade, and stopped. You two know what to do? Rodriguez asked. Juan nodded. Get them a few miles off of the road, then cut across on the next highway, he replied. Nothing to it. I'll see you back in town this evening, Rodriguez said and the men both nodded as Juan rolled up the window. Antonio popped out of the sunroof with a large machine gun, cracking his neck back and forth. Rodriguez waved to his companions. We should get back to our vehicle, just in case this doesn't hold. They headed back, just as Antonio opened fire. The machine gun was incredibly loud, bullets ripping through the front line of the ghouls, cutting creatures in half. The first spray stumbled the line a bit, but the downed ghouls were quickly swallowed up by the mass. Antonio smacked the roof of the SUV, prompting his partner to start the slow drive. The trio watched from their truck as the machine gun fire continued, shredding zombies and drawing a gigantic pile of them off of the interstate and onto the highway. While a significant number were leaving, the majority of them continued marching straight ahead. They noticed that while some of them attempted to adjust course and follow the others, they were pushed ahead by the overwhelming force of the ghouls behind them. As soon as they would slow down, others would catch up to them and shove ahead, keeping them moving in one direction on the interstate. Well, that explains why we're only able to push off a handful at a time, Sparks declared. Rodriguez nodded thoughtfully. It would appear as though if we want to get more, we're going to have to set off some sort of device to create a buffer zone he mused. That way, the ones in front won't be forced ahead. Explosion, you say? Rufus piped up with a grin. I can help with that. Rodriguez chuckled and patted the old man on the back. I'm sure you can, friend. They turned their attention back to the mass of marching death as the first zombies reached the car barricade. They pressed up against it, causing a bit of a backlog. This allowed for a few more ghouls to be drawn off of the interstate, which excited the group. Hell yeah! Looks like it's working! Rufus exclaimed. This went on for about thirty seconds or so, until screeching filled the air. At first they were confused, but within seconds it dawned on them all at the same time, their stomachs sinking as one. The zombie force was so strong that it was pushing the cars along the road. Jesus Christ! Rufus breathed. They watched in horror as the zombies pressed up against the cars, crushed beneath the weight. A few heads popped off as their torsos were flattened by the collective weight of a million zombies. The screeching tires grew louder. More cars pushed further and further. Soon they moved with a steady speed, albeit slowly. The cars on the outer edges began to move in different directions. 
the more weight put on the front ends of the vehicles than the back or centre. All told, within three minutes the barricade that they had worked so hard to construct was in tatters. Zombies on the outer edges had successfully shoved them out of the way, onto the shoulder, and in one case, rolling down an embankment into a building below. The other cars turned sideways, rotating ninety degrees, more zombies filtering through them easily. In the grand scheme of things, they were little more than a nuisance than an actual obstacle. The group stared at it, dejected, watching as the stream of zombies that were going off the interstate had cut off, and everything was coming their way. We should go, Rodriguez muttered. Rufus shook his head, standing beside the truck. Come on, Sparks urged from the truck bed. He finally relented, hopping into the back as Rodriguez fired it up. He turned and quickly sped down the interstate towards the next highway bridge. As they approached it, it was still close enough that they could still see the horde trailing them, and the front line of ghouls that Trenton and Javier had managed to break off. Well, at least they were able to pick up the zombies in town and move them out, Rufus said. Sparks nodded with a sigh. Good to know something went as planned today, she said. Rodriguez drove a quarter mile past the bridge, which had steep grassy embankments on either side of it leading down to the highway. They stopped to watch the horde as it pressed on towards them. "'Looks like we managed to time that about right,' he said. Sparks nodded. "'Now we just have to hope they see the ones under them and want to join,' she added. "'We got anything to throw down there?' Rufus asked. "'Cause a little ruckus?' Sparks shook her head. "'Whatever we pull isn't going to be much, so I think it would be better to know if zombie noises will actually divert them,' she said. I agree, Rodriguez said with a nod. Information is more valuable at this point. Rufus nodded, leaning his head back in his seat. The trio watched as the two zombie masses approached one another. The main interstate horde reached the bridge first, walking over it as the zombies below moved under it. Some of the creatures below were moaning as they went under the bridge, creating an echoing effect of snarls and gnashing teeth. This sound reached the zombies on the outer edge of the main horde, a handful of them, no more than thirty or forty, wandering away from the main group and tumbled down the embankment to inspect the noise. The group collectively sighed, dismay on their faces. Another bust, Rufus groaned. Not necessarily, Rodriguez replied through the window, shaking his head. We now learned that they will follow another's voice, even if it's out of sight and far away. This could be useful. The old man threw up his hands. How do you figure? he demanded. You want to start caging up zombies on the side of the road? You need to think less literally, my friend, Rodriguez replied. Rufus pursed his lips. At this stage in the day, you should be thankful I'm thinking at all. Rodriguez chuckled. Fair enough, he said. You should know that El Paso has more than its fair share of electronic stores. There are multiple lines of battery-operated speakers and audio recorders. Who gets to be the lucky one to go capture zombie moans? Rufus asked. Sparks raised her hand. I vote Trenton, she said. I second that, Rodriguez agreed. Rufus narrowed his eyes playfully. Quick to throw our man to the wolves, huh? he asked. Rodriguez shrugged. I don't know him that well, but he did volunteer for that suicide run, he replied. I would have assumed he enjoyed that kind of danger. You make a compelling case, Rufus agreed. He gets my vote as well. The trio looked back to the horde, the front edge of which was nearly across the bridge. That appears to be our cue to leave, Sparks said with a sigh. Should probably go get Trenton anyway. Would you mind riding up front to navigate? Rodriguez asked her, raising a hand. Just in case we need to adjust course. She nodded. Not at all. She turned to Rufus, kissing his cheek swiftly. You good back here on your own? She asked. He smirked. Well, I was planning on cuddling up with you, he drawled, but I guess that can wait. She winked at him. Well, we do have a long ride back to Fabens, she said, and then jumped down from the truck bed. She hopped into the passenger seat, and Rodriguez took off as Rufus got comfy in the back. They drove up half a mile before finding a slight embankment that led off of the interstate and to the surface roads below. There were only a few zombies spread pretty far out as they worked their way towards the highway. Should probably stay a couple of blocks off of the main road, just to be safe, Sparks suggested. 
That was my thought as well, Rodriguez agreed. If you want to keep a lookout to the main road, so we can get a sense of just how much we cleared it out? She nodded. Will do. As they drove, she stared towards the highway, watching every side street leading to it and finding them completely clear, with only the occasional straggler milling about. None were on the highway itself. This went on for several blocks before Rufus knocked on the back window. Sparks slid it open. Where the hell is everybody? he asked through the opening. I thought this town was crawling with those things. I don't know, she replied, shaking her head. The rest of the drive was just as peaceful as the first half, with them finally laying eyes on the pickup spot. There were a few zombies out front, banging on the glass, no doubt having caught sight of the duo hiding inside. Rodriguez stopped the truck about twenty yards away from the creatures, and all three of them hopped out and walked forward. The boys inside, having likely spotted them, banged hard on the windows, making sure the zombies fixated on them. Rodriguez and Sparks pulled out knives and began to jam the blades in quick succession along the row of ghouls, quickly dropping them all to the ground. A few moments later, Trenton opened the bakery door, and the tantalizing scent of freshly baked bread wafted out to them. "'Wasn't expecting that,' Sparks said, closing her eyes to take a deep whiff. "'What the hell is that?' Rufus barked. Trenton laughed. "'That, my grumpy friend, is fresh-baked bread,' he declared. "'You baked bread?' the old man exclaimed. "'Would it be such a shock to find out that I did?' Trenton asked and the other three immediately nodded in unison. "'Well, I happen to agree with you,' he admitted. "'This is all Javier's work.' Rodriguez walked inside, shaking his head. "'Are you holding out on me, Javier?' he called. "'I was unaware you had this particular skill set.' "'I'm not a professional, mind you,' Javier replied as he turned towards them, swiping flour from his pants. "'But my little girl really likes it, so I've been baking it with her for the last six months or so.' Rufus licked his lips. "'Well, let's have a taste, then,' he said, spreading his arms. "'Should be out in a few minutes,' Javier replied with a chuckle, and waved them in. Sparks secured the door behind them, and the trio wandered around the main room. There were wedding cake displays everywhere, and cases filled with rotten goods. The time and lack of electricity had taken a toll on what would have been delicious treats. "'I can see why you baked your own,' Sparks said wrinkling her nose as she studied a green croissant. Because that is nasty. Yes, a lot of the food and ingredients had spoiled, Javier said, shaking his head. Thankfully, the components for bread are both simple and have a long shelf life. Throw in a gas oven, and I put my time in here to good use. He headed off into the kitchen to check on the loaves while the others stood around in the display room. I hope that your effort to break up that hoard went better than ours, Trenton said with a sigh. Rufus shook his head. About as well, I'm afraid, he said. Worse, if you consider I had to do cardio. He pretended to shudder, and Trenton raised an eyebrow in confusion. We pushed some cars onto the interstate to create a barricade, Sparks explained, rolling her eyes at the old man's antics. Guessing it didn't work? Trenton asked tentatively. Rufus shook his head. They pushed through them in a matter of seconds, he said. Short of moving a football stadium into their path, I don't see us stopping them with what we have. Have a little optimism, Sparks said, giving his bicep a squeeze. We still have a few days. He sighed. Just not hopeful, that's all. Well, my friend, it just means you have to build bigger bombs to help us succeed, Rodriguez declared. I tell you what, tomorrow I will take you into El Paso to go shopping, he said, holding up a finger. I get the sense that our selection is going to be more robust than what you have in Fabens. Rufus's eyes lit up like a kid at Christmas. See, Sparks said, patting his shoulder, even if we fail, you're at least going to get to have a hell of a lot of fun. He grinned. All right, I'm in, he declared. Javier interrupted by exiting the kitchen with a cooling rack. Atop it were a few fresh loaves of French bread still steaming. Normally we'd have to let it cool before slicing it, he said as he set it down on a table. But please, tear into it while it's hot. We're not going to get to have this very often. You say that, Rodriguez said, raising a hand. But I think you might have new assignments in the near future. Trenton chuckled, making me wish I had learned how to bake in college. 
making me wish I had gone to college so I could have gotten baked, Rufus quipped. Would have been a lot better than going to Nam. The group clustered around the table, tearing off chunks of the warm, fresh bread, savoring every single earthy bite. Within a matter of minutes, both loaves were gone. Have ye? I can't thank you enough for that, Sparks moaned as she swallowed her last mouthful. He bowed a little at the waist. It's my pleasure, ma'am, he said politely. I second that, Rufus declared, patting his belly. Good work. Javier nodded in appreciation, as Rodriguez straightened his shoulders. We should be getting back, he said. We still have a lot of work that needs to get done. As the group walked out the door and began to get loaded up into the truck, Spark stopped before hopping in. Can we make a detour before leaving? she asked. Rodriguez nodded. Of course, he replied. Where would you like to go? The highway, she said. He contemplated for a moment and then shrugged and nodded. They clambered into the truck and headed out, and he made the turn towards the highway. After a few moments they pulled onto it, stopping in the center of the road. He looked both ways, seeing not a single living zombie. The only visible bodies were the dead ones on the road. There's nothing here, he breathed. How is that possible? Even the few thousand we managed to break off was big enough to get the ones in town to get moving, Sparks explained. That group that was on the highway here had to have been at least as big as what we pulled off of the interstate, maybe even bigger. Rodriguez nodded thoughtfully. So if we can get a big enough group moving in one direction, he said slowly, they can force others to do the same. I don't know what we can do with that information, she admitted, but I feel like it's good information to have. He nodded again. Agreed, he said. As I've found over the years in my various <clears throat> work situations, having the right information can make all the difference in the world. She smirked. And I've found that over the years in all my <clears throat> work situations, she said playfully, that information does make all the difference. He chuckled as she called out his vagueness, having not particularly wanted to say criminal activity as his work situation. I suppose we are far enough into our relationship that we don't have judgment about our prior lives, he admitted. I think that's a safe bet, Sparks agreed. He started driving back to the interstate to turn off, and she held up a finger. There is an exception, however, she said. He raised an eyebrow. And that would be? he asked. Who is the greatest wrestler of all time? she asked. Rodriguez cracked a smile. Well, I am from Mexico, he said, and I'm pretty sure my citizenship would get revoked if I said anyone other than El Santo. Okay, I can appreciate that, Sparks admitted, nodding. But gun to your head, if you had to pick an American wrestler, who would you pick? He chewed his lip for a moment, thinking, American born or American worked? he asked. American worked, she clarified, at least for the majority of their career. He thought for another few moments, and then finally said, If you're talking work ethic and presence inside and outside the ring, the answer is Ric Flair. Good answer, she replied, nodding. However, he continued, a special mention has to go to Mick Foley for being the craziest person to ever set foot in a ring. Sparks smirked. Or on top of a cage, she added. So, who is your pick? he asked. Or will you allow me to guess? She thought for a moment, and then motioned for him to continue. Go ahead and guess, she said. That could be fun. You look like a Hulk Hogan type of woman, Rodriguez said. She deadpanned. It's a good thing you're driving, she said. He laughed. Why is that? Because if you weren't, then that accusation would be worthy of an ass-kicking, she declared in a level, serious voice. There was a moment of tense silence before they both broke out laughing, big belly laughs that were much needed after such a trying day. And it felt good to be able to bring some joy to one another, a nice diversion from the trying days to come. The End Up next, as the Horde continues to march, a risky plan is attempted to give Sergeant Hammond and his rogue team of soldiers a way through the blockades, and into El Paso, in Creeping Death, Part 3.